الحمد لله رب العالمين وافطر الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين. It is a pleasure to be back here again as always every year. الحمد لله we have the um, honor of gathering and um, this is actually the only time I get to see all of you um, this time in, uh, in the fall. And today I've been given a very difficult topic. Uh, it's one that's hard for us to talk about and hard for us to listen to, I'm sure. But it's something that um, obviously is an inevitable uh, reality, the topic of death and its implications in our uh, lives. So, you know, today we want to ask ourselves some questions about death, why it is, in fact, so unpleasant to, you know, to bring up even though it's such a frequent phenomenon. In fact, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, every uh, second uh, worldwide, there are at least 100, 105 deaths, every second. So, you know, so since I started speaking, hundreds of uh, people have already died throughout the world. So it's literally a, uh, you know, widespread phenomenon that's all around us, and, uh, you know, they're uh, reminding us uh, of our mortality. But it, even though it's so uh, widespread, it still doesn't reduce, uh, its widespread effect doesn't reduce its uh, discomfort. Um, and talking about it is still as um, unpleasant as it always was. So how does um, speaking about death, how does remembrance of death actually uh, affect the quality of our lives? Okay, why are we speaking, uh, how, why are we speaking about it? How can we come to terms with it? How can we make it uh, a more palatable topic uh, for us? And to begin with, we want to say that actually, notwithstanding what we've said, um, death is probably the most relevant topic uh, that one could actually choose to discuss. And we're going to look first and foremost at what makes death the, the most relevant topic that we could possibly be discussing at any conference. What makes, so that's the first question we're going to uh, seek to answer, inshallah. What makes death such a relevant topic for us? I'm going to list two simple reasons. The first one is nothing in life really is guaranteed except for death. This is the only thing that is absolutely guaranteed for every single individual. There's nothing else that anyone can um, guarantee that you will receive in this world with any level of certainty except for this one thing. This is something that everyone must experience because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in Surah Al-Imran, verse 185, بَعْدَ أَعْضُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَا أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازْ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ دُنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ You know the verse which uh, says that every single soul shall taste death. And then, and indeed, you will be given your, giving, uh, given your rewards on the day of judgment. So whoever is taken away, removed from the fire and entered into Jannah has indeed achieved success, has indeed become successful. And what is the life of this world except mata'al ghurur? Yani it's, a, it's a deceptive enjoyment, a transitory, uh, as we know, deceptive uh, enjoyment. So... When we think about, for example, you know, the more um, uh, uh, wealthy segments of society, uh, the more, more fortunate ones um, that are considered, you know, wealthy and uh, healthy for most uh, for the most part of their lives, you know, perhaps they will be spared the many of the tribulations that other people go through. Uh, they may not see as much poverty or trial or tribulation uh, in this world. But one trial that no one, not even the wealthiest person, not even the richest person in the world can um, escape is that of death. So the trial of death is something that everyone um, uh, has to go through. No one will be spared of this. And the second thing that makes death such a relevant topic is because of when we don't contemplate or think about death, it can very easily lead to a life, uh, what will later become a life of regret. So the element of regret, this emotion of regret, is one of the most difficult human emotions to deal with. I, you know, think about a decision you've made or something you said, um, you know, a certain path or direction in life that you took that you later regretted. You know, it's, it's, you know, we all have this experience, you know, when that um, feeling just gnaws at you in a way that no other uh, feeling really can. You know, it's, it's, it's just a horrible, uh, you know, experience to go through um, because the time has passed. There's nothing you can now do to make that up or to change it. 
once you know once a certain decision has been made or a certain word has been said uh, to someone else um, you know, so this is a an emotion that human beings want to avoid at all costs even in this world so what about avoiding it in the hereafter you know it's much more serious the matter will be much more serious we don't you know, this is why yawm al qiyamah the day of judgment is called uh, called yawm al hasra wa nadam which means the yawm al hasra is the day of regret the day of remorse and nadam these are the actual names given to the day of judgment that everyone will be in a certain level of regret on that day even the good people even the good uh, muslims that struggled and tried their best to be you know uh, as pleasing to allah as they could be everyone will be in a certain uh, will be experiencing certain level of regret what we want to do is we want to minimize this experience of regret on uh, the day of judgment we want to uh, you know make sure that uh, we can do as much as we possibly can to uh, deal with this emotion right now before it becomes uh, overwhelming and this is something that uh, this theme of uh, regret uh, or you know wanting a second chance um, wanting to go back to the world uh, after death. This is a, a theme that reoccurs in the Quran when it talks about death, it talks about the Day of Judgment, it talks about people that when, once Allah subhanahu wa resurrects them, uh, this is one of the first thing that, will, that they'll say, oh, you know, if I just had another chance. It's called Qarra in the Quran, that, you know, if only I had another chance, another Qarra to go back um, to the world, if I could be just given a little more respite, you know. And uh, there's another verse actually which says, وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَنَاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحَدُكُمُ الْمَوْتِ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي لَوْلَا أَخَرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ فَأَصَّدَّقَ وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Which means that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, spend uh, in the way of Allah from what He has given you before a day comes or rather before death comes to one of you. And then He would say, my Lord, you know, had you just given me a little more respite, had you given me just a little more uh, time, you know, a short period. And everyone, interestingly, always asks for just a little bit more time. And then I would have given in sadaqah, and I would have been among the righteous ones. So uh, we have to understand the nature of time in order to really, uh, you know, inshallah, not be among the people in this category where they're just asking for more time, hoping for a little bit more, uh, you know, respite. The nature of time is that time is very deceptive in and of itself. All of us um, complain about not having enough time. But if we think about it, our life, our lifespan is nothing but time. While we always find ourselves uh, in a shortage of it, it's all also the only thing we have until we die. What, you know, what is a person except a number of years, which is a number of months, which is a number of days, right? So basically what we've been given uh, until we die is, is time to, uh, you know, um, work for the hereafter. So, um, because of, uh, you know, the fact that this has been given to us, it carries a very deceptive flavor to it. We uh, always think that, inshallah, I will do it tomorrow, right? We tend to put off things because we think that we still have time. So while we always complain verbally about not having enough time, about a lack of time, we act the opposite. We act as if the, as if we have a lot of time. So, because of this contradiction in you know uh, saying one thing and actually acting in another way, we are um, you know oh, not able to accomplish much. So, this is something that um, you know, inshallah, we want to be able to analyze and understand uh, the nature of time, so that we're not stuck in a situation where we're you know just hoping for more, begging for more. And there's a beautiful quote by. Uh, Al-A'la bin Ziyad rahimahullah, where he says, uh, as advice to all of us, one of you should consider that death has come to him. Yani that he has already died. Each one of us should consider, should act like she has already died. And after dying, she asked Allah for respite. She asked Allah for a little bit more time. And that Allah gave us that time. So let him use this time working in Allah's obedience. Because this is that chance. This is that respite that people will be begging for and asking just a little bit more. This is it. We already have it. We know people will want it, but then at that time it will not be granted. So we need to consider that, you know, this is that uh, respite that people uh, will be begging for. Inshallah, we need to use it uh, now. And uh, there's another uh, lovely uh, saying, Dunya sa'a fa ta'a. 
which means that the dunya, the life of this world, is a sa'a. It's, it's like it's one hour. Sa'a is uh, referred to a short uh, amount of time, a brief period of time. It's, it's called sa'a, right? Uh, classically. Now, uh, in modern times, it's, it refers to 60 minutes. So, uh, anyhow, a, uh, the dunya is a short amount of time. It's one hour, it's sa'a. فَجَعَلْهَا طَعَا So make it an hour of obedience. Make it ta'a, make it obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not something that we'll have to be uh, ashamed of later, inshallah. And in, in fact, it is, it is these deeds of obedience that are going to cause us to give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after our death. You know how we, uh, when we wake up in the morning, all of us say, Alhamdulillah, alladhi ahyana ba'da ma amatana wa ilayhi nushur. Right? We make this dua that, you know, all praise be to the one who gave me life after having given me death, right? Ba'da ma amatana. It's from maut, which is because uh, sis, uh, sleep is like a death, right? And, and, and it's a sister of death in a sense. So we thank Allah for life after that death of sleep upon rising in the morning. What is it that we will thank Allah for? There's also something that we will thank Allah for <coughs> after we die. And what is that thing? It is going to be the acts of obedience and taqwa and ta'a that He guided us to in our lives. Again, um, Safiyan al Thawri, rahimahullah, uh, he was one of the great uh, you know, people of hadith. He says, In the morning, the mu'mineen thank Allah for life, for survival. And after death, they are thankful for their taqwa. They're thankful for their uh, obedience. So, you know, this is something that we need to be investing in. You know, that alhamdulillah, thank God, literally, that I uh, was guided to that, that I actually did that. Now, um, again, the topic is the implications of death in our lives, right? What are, what are the implications of remembering death? What I want to mention um, are seven benefits. In this lecture, we're going to go through seven benefits of remembering um, death that we can extract from uh, Quran and Hadith. And, uh, and inshallah, you know, if we walk away with that, then uh, you know, I hope we can incorporate it into our lives. The first thing, if we look at all the turmoil in the world, um, a lot of it can be traced back to the root cause of greed, as we all know. What death does is that it actually reduces desires. It actually engenders, it cultivates a, a feeling of contentment. Where This is what the Prophet ﷺ told us, أَكْثِرُوا أَذِكْرَ هَذَا مِنْ لَزَادِ أَكْثِرُوا ذِكْرَ هَذَا مِنْ لَزَادِ الموت. Which means that be frequent in your remembrance of that which kills desires, that which slaughters desires. And what is that? الموت, death itself. Okay, this is something that, uh, you know, just cuts at the root of uh, excessive uh, desire. So this is what we mean when we say that um, even though it's an, uh, you know, a difficult topic to, to speak about, it's also the most relevant topic because once you start contemplating it, it renders all other matters irrelevant. Everything else that was so important uh, you know, a few minutes ago, everything that we were so mad about or so infuriated with someone uh, you know, uh, last night, once we start thinking about our own death or the death of this individual that we're, you know, perhaps uh, had a fallout with, it becomes petty. It becomes, you know, it loses its, its, its weight, becomes completely insignificant. So, you know, this is um, what we need to think about when something really hurts us, when, you know, when something really, uh, you know, ma makes us angry. We need to think about our death or the death of that person. Okay, because one of uh, these is going to happen first, right? Either you will die before that person or you'll see that person die before you. So when we think about that happening, it's immediately going to lower the argument to something of no value. This is the relevance and the implication of death, that it renders all other matters as irrelevant once we contemplate it. And just a, a point about uh, you know, expending our uh, energies, our emotional energy, uh, rather wasting it with people. Uh, sometimes, you know, when we're just so mad at someone, it takes away so much from our positive, productive energy. That could have been, to, that anger is like a poison, more harmful to the person, uh, him or herself. It actually does more harm to us than it does to the other person. And this is why forgiveness is such a, um, has such properties of healing. You know, even non-Muslims talk about this, you know, that we need to be able to, when someone wrongs us, we need to be able to uh, forgive them. Like the woman who was shot in the face and disfigured, what was one of the things that she did? Is She forgave the person who, who shot her. Because you really cannot get on with your life. You cannot heal emotionally until 
you let that, uh, you know, your, your heart expand with the, uh, with, the, with the balm of forgiveness. So, expending our, pre our present precious energies in people and pursuits that will ultimately become petty on the Day of Judgment, this is the most damaging type of foolishness that we can, uh, you know, waste our way our lives in. So this is something we really need to uh, focus on. You know, if something is bothering you, someone is bothering you, uh, think about it. Is it really worth it? You know, is this really benefiting me uh, and my goals in this world? Will this benefit me on the Day of Judgment? And 99% uh, of the time you're going to see it's going to be more beneficial for me to let this go, to actually have it written as one of my good deeds that I forgave the person for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why you know, forgiving a person while you have the ability to harm them or to take revenge, this is why this has such a high status. You know, these are among, this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us. Um, there's a hadith which means that, you know, the strong one is not the one who is able to you know, wrestle um, his or her enemy down. Rather, it's the one who's able to control their anger. Because that means they're really in charge. Right? It's not the anger or the emotions that control them, rather it is they who are able to uh, control their anger. And this is uh, the example that we find uh, from the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, right? You know the uh, very famous incident of Ali, radiallahu an, when he was in the battlefield, you know, uh, very close to his enemy. His enemy was at the point of death under Ali, radiallahu an. And now that the enemy saw that Ali, radiallahu an, is about to, you know, end my life, he wanted to end it in a way that gave Ali the most pain or the most humiliation or the most hurt. So what he did is right when he was about to get killed, he spat. He spit on the face of Ali radiallahu anhu. So as soon as he did that, instead of you know becoming more infuriated and killing the person, he moved back and he left him. And you know the, the other person was you know just shocked, like what happened? You know you had the perfect opportunity here and you just let it go and Ali radiallahu anh, clarified he said that when I had you before it was only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there was no other intention no other niyyah that I had but after you spit on me it infuriated me then my desire uh, you know was motivated by anger and I didn't want to pollute my intention I didn't want my action to be for myself to avenge you know, a personal wrong. I wanted it to be only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So come again after he had lost his, uh, you know, after the anger had left him, then he said, now come again and let us you know, re-engage. So um, this obviously takes a lot of uh, spiritual discipline. This takes a lot of tazkiyah, self-purification. That does not happen overnight. Uh, it's very hard for us to distinguish where our niya ends for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and starts to feed our own egos. You know, so this is something that uh, requires a lot of uh, deep self-analysis uh, uh, and reflection where we can really start uh, filtering and purifying uh, our intentions for his sake. So the first benefit that we just mentioned is that uh, the remembrance of death reduces desires. It engenders contentment. Um, now the next thing, the second thing, the second great benefit of remembering uh, death is it's actually a sign of intelligence. You know, so, uh, some times people just think, you know, why do you talk about this? It's so morbid, you know. Uh, you will hear people say this to you, you're so morbid, you're such a party pooper, like why are you talking about this? In fact, in our deen, the Prophet ﷺ has indicated that these are actually people of intelligence because once Ibn Umar, an, the son of Umar, asked um, the Prophet ﷺ, who are the most intelligent or the wisest of the believers? And the Prophet ﷺ, what did he answer? You know, he didn't say the best businessmen or, you know, the people who do such and such. His answer was, أَكْثَرُهُمْ لِلْمَوْتِ ذِكْرًا وَأَشَدُّهُمْ إِسْتِعْدَادًا لَهُ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْأَكْيَاسِ ذَهَبُوا بِشَرْفَ الدُّنْيَا وَكَرَامَةِ الْآخِرَةِ Beautiful response from the Prophet ﷺ. He says the most intelligent or the wisest uh, people are those who remember death the most and then they are most intense in their preparations for it. Yani they're constantly busy in good actions, in deeds that are, uh, you know, by which they're preparing for their death. <laughs> These are the most intelligent people. <laughs> they have taken the honor, the nobility of this world and the honor of the hereafter. Because in dunya, these people, they're, they're constantly busy in righteous actions. They don't waste time. They're doing good for themselves and for their communities. They have the uh, respect and um, you know honor of uh, the of this world, and they're also going to receive this type of honor 
uh, in the hereafter. So they've t gone with the sharf of the dunya, the nobility of the dunya, as well as karamat al akhra the honor of the next world. So, and now, uh, in order to become these types of people, we need to be able to identify their traits. How is it, what traits do I need to ad adopt or cultivate in order to, you know, uh, start emulating, showing these qualities? So, uh, A, these people have focused tasks in dunya, okay? Number two, second benefit of death, sign of intelligence. Point A under number two is that these people have focused tasks in uh, dunya. They're people of focus, you know? They're just not uh, haphazardly doing one thing or the other, you know? They're not tangential, just, you know, uh, from point A to point B without realizing how they're connected. They're, they don't squander time. Rather, you observe uh, people who are, are able to accomplish the most in a short amount of time, they're the ones that engage in what I call cumulative activity, right? Where one activity of theirs is actually building on another, which they know is going in a certain direction, is going to end in a finished product, right? It's going to end in the accomplishment of some meaningful goal, okay? It's like working towards a product. that You have a clear aim and you're putting the parts together so at the end you have something beautiful. You have something to show for it, okay? Like the chapters in a book, right? Um, so this is something that uh, is a trait of actually those people who are able to accomplish a lot in, uh, in a short amount of time. Uh, point B, their energies are directed to maximizing the returns in akhira, okay? So energy is a uh, priceless commodity, right? If you expend it in one area, you obviously have less left of it to expend in another. So, you know, it's, it's very, they're very, you know, stingy with where they're going to uh, invest. And they invested in those areas that are going to give the maximum profits uh, in akhirah. So, you know, it's very uh, analytical and, and business-like in a sense. Uh, point C is that these people are their action-oriented people. They have concrete goals. And concrete goals are not enough. They're essential, but they're not enough. After that, you need practical plans to accomplish those goals. You know, you may have, you know, aspirations that reach to the heavens, but if there's no practical a uh, plan that fits you, no one size fits all, right? It has to fit you. Um, then, you know, there will be no accomplishment. So, and D, these people realize that death has no U-turns. Okay, there's no uh, no turning back. It's once it happens, there's there's no, so there's this deep realization of the finality uh, of death, that, that, you know, how short really time is. And what helps really um, ingrain uh, the brevity of life is, um, a reading by a good biographies, reading bios of people uh, that have accomplished uh, a lot of Muslims, non-Muslims, uh, especially the Sahaba, and because there's always a birth date and there's a death date. There's no good bio that you use except that you know there's there's this little parenthetical uh, you know uh, numbers numbers in parentheses that tell you the story of their life. You know, so the story of one's life it's really two numbers. It's it's between two numbers. The day you, uh, the year you were born, and the year that you uh, die. And uh, this is why someone said, "Beware of death in this life." Yani, um, think about or reflect. Be ready. Be prepared. Working for death in this life before you end up in a life that you wish would end in death, but it will not. Isn't this the cry of the uh, people of the fire? Right. They're going to call out to thee. Uh, angel of that guards the fire, right? They're going to Malik. His name is Malik, right? This is in the Quran. His name is Malik. Malik iqdi alayna rabbuk. Yani there will be calling out to him, and one of the uh, it is said that they will be calling out to him, Ya Malik, Ya Malik, O Malik, O Malik, for 40 years before he will actually even answer them. This is how, we, how displeased he is with the people that have displeased Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after that, when you will finally, uh, you know, listen to them. The only wish will be for death. But you know, one of the things that is going to be killed, the only thing that's going to be killed on the Day of Judgment is death itself. Death itself will come in the form of a ram and it will be slaughtered and uh, it will be proclaimed that there is no death after today. This is why beware of death in this life. Here we have death. Here this is something that is going to happen to us. Before you end up in a life that you wish would end in death, but it will not. We seek Allah's refuge uh, from that. Um, benefit number three, one of the benefits of remembering death, is how it highlights the brevity of life. Just what we were mentioning right now. Number three, death highlights the brevity of life. You know, if you don't really think about the end of something, 
you won't appreciate how brief it really is. But ultimately, anything that uh, you know will ultimately end, whether it's after 50 years or 100 years, if something has a finite end, no matter how long it is, it is ultimately brief, right? Because how long is 100 years in this you know, wide spectrum of millions of years of life or billions of years that Allah has put us uh, on this planet? So anything that has a finite end, regardless of how long it is, is ultimately short. And there's a, a, a really in, a beautiful, insightful saying by someone about the adhan that is given when we are born. Listen to this quote. When we are born, the adhan is given, but there is no salah. When we die, salah is prayed upon us, but there is no adhan. The adhan given at the time of our birth is the adhan for the salah prayed at the time of our death. That is how short life is, the time between the adhan and the salah. So hate none, love all, pray sincerely, forgive genuinely, and pray your salah before the salah is prayed for you. you know, SubhanAllah, Annie, if we just had only this quote for this lecture, it would have been enough. Really, if we think about it and you know, contemplate it, this is the reality and this is the brevity uh, of, of this you know, drop of time that we have been given. The fourth benefit that the remembrance of death brings, um, as Hassan al-Basri uh, said, he said death exposes the reality of life. If death serves a purpose, if, if death is a tool for anything, it, it is a tool for exposing. The purpose of death is to expose, the presence of death exposes the reality of the nature of this life. He said, Rahimahullah, فَضَحُ الْمَوْتُ الدُّنْيَا فَلَمْ يَتْرُكْ لِذِي اللُّبْ فِيهَا فَرْحَ وَمَا أَلْزَمَ عَبْدٌ قَلْبَ ذِكْرُ الْمَوْتِ إِلَّا صَغُرَةَ الدُّنْيَا عَلَيْهِ وَهَانَ عَلَيْهِ جَمِيعَ مَا فِي Which means that death in fact has exposed this world. It hasn't left anything in it for a, a person of you know, contemplation and intellect. Death doesn't leave anything to really be happy uh, about, you know, ex you know, it's like extraordinarily happy and jubilant, uh, overly jubilant about. If you think that, you know, whatever it is, it's going, it's going to be taken away from you or you will be taken away. So there is no person that, uh, you know, forces or makes their heart contemplate uh, death, except that the effect of that contemplation is that the dunya becomes very small and petty in their eyes. And everything in it just you know loses its significance really because it's just so uh, it's just so transitory so it really exposes the presence of death all around us really exposes life for what it is you know we don't like to think about it that way but that's what it does this is why um, moving on to uh, the fifth uh, benef point of benefit is that the great we're talking about implication that the death holds in our lives the greatest implication that death all around us holds is that it provides lessons to the living this is what death is. Death is the greatest lesson for those that are still alive. As Ibn Mas'ud, uh, he said, man which means that the felicitous one, the successful one, the lucky one, is the one who is able to take admonition from those around him. Yani, if you wait for your own death and then realize, oh, I should have prepared for this, it's not beneficial. But if you see someone else die, as we all do, all around us, and take lesson from that, this is the uh, felicitous one. This is the successful, uh, fortunate person. You know that we're really benefiting from other people. If you know, if after a funeral, you know, you you don't really feel a change in your heart. You know, if we don't try to change our actions, then are we really taking lesson uh, from from what is happening all around us? And Abu Darda, the the famous Sahabi, radiyallahu an, he says, either. ذُكِرُ الْمَوْتَ فَعُدْ نَفْسَكَ كَأَحَدُهُمْ فَعُدْ نَفْسَكَ كَأَحَدِهُمْ Which means that if, uh, when, or rather when the deceased are mentioned, when the people that have died, they're mentioned, count yourselves among them. This is how we need to be, you know, understanding uh, these types of reminders. And even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet uh, in the Quran, إِنَّكَ مَيِّتْ What does that mean? You are dead. Yani, it is, life is so short, and death is so inevitable, it's as if, you know, you're already, you know, dead, uh, in, uh, so to speak. So, you know, this is really something that, um, you know, we don't 
take advantage of when we have, you know, death, like I said, 100 uh, plus people per second. You know, uh, I've been speaking for over 10 minutes, right? Over 1,000 people have already died since this lecture began uh, around the world. But are we really taking a lesson um, from that? Okay, point number six. The remembrance of death, this engenders the right attitude towards dunya. Remembrance of death engenders the right attitude towards dunya. What is the right attitude we have to have towards dunya? That of estrangement. What do, we, what do I mean by estrangement? The Prophet ﷺ once um, took Abdullah bin Amr, he was with him, he took him by the shoulders. And he said to him, Kun fid dunya, you know when you have, uh, when you want to tell someone something, you know you could just tell them. When you want to really get their attention, you'll address them by their name first, right? You'll say their name at the beginning rather than at the end to get their attention. And when you really want to impress something that's very critical, very important, you're going to have some bodily contact, right? You're either going to grab their hand or grab their shoulder. And this shows the uh, imp significance of what's about to follow in terms of speech, right? So this is what the Prophet, uh, if the Prophet ﷺ just said anything, it was, it was critically important, right? But when he's actually using bodily contact, then just imagine how important it is what he's about to say. And so he took the shoulders of Abdullah bin Umar, radiallahu anh, and said to him, Kun fi dunya ka gharib abidi sabil. You know, be in this world as if you are a stranger or someone who is just passing by, like, you know, a traveler, a wayfarer. So Ibn Umar, this you know, teaching had such an effect uh, on him, on his psyche, on his mentality. It just changed his perception uh, of, of the world. And he, that, this is why he's famous, uh, known for saying, amsayta fala as-sabah. That if, he would say to people, if you reach the evening, don't expect to live till the next morning. And if you actually wake up in the morning, then don't expect to live until the evening, or don't wait till the evening, you know, for any of your uh, actions. Just do it now. And take from your saha, from your health, for your sickness. And from your life, for your death. Because oh, there's a narration that people who were active in uh, good deeds while they had health, inshallah, they, those deeds will continue to be jotted down for them when they become sick and are unable to do those deeds because of their uh, physical health. So this is, this is what it means to take from your health for your sickness. Because sickness is an inevitable part of you know, the human life cycle for the majority of us, right? This is just naturally the way things end for the majority of humankind. It's through sickness that precedes death, right? So it's probably going to happen to most of us, right? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for al-afiyah, of course. We ask him for well-being and saha. But if there was no, uh, nothing done in the days of health, what, what is it that we're depositing for the days of sickness? You know, there's going to be nothing there. So, and وَخُذْ مِنْ حَيَاتِكَ وَمِنْ حَيَاتِكَ لِمَوْتِكَ And take from your life for your death. You know, this is inevitable. Perhaps, uh, inshallah, may Allah just take us without going through a trial, uh, the trial of sickness. But uh, there's no, no one who is spared from the trial of mawt. So take from your life. Inshallah, may it be a life of health for your death. Because that is inevitable. So one of the greatest dangers that we uh, find ourselves falling into is extension of hopes, right? This is called, uh, there's a lo long chapter on this in, in the Arabic sources. It's called Tool al-Amal, right? All the books of death and, you know, Tazkiyat will mention this, that human beings are struck with this, you know, almost epidemic, the spiritual epidemic. It's called Tool al-Amal, which is extension of hopes, you know. Think I have a lot of time, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You know, inshallah, I'll get to it after I get married, after I finish school, after I b build this house, after I land this job. It just never ends, you know. And for those of us that are in our 30s and beyond, we, we see that. Now we actually have uh, experienced that in our lives, you know. There's no uh, stage where you feel that, okay, now I can start becoming a better Muslim. No, that just never happens. It, we, it has to be a simultaneous process that, you know, is occurring. Um, so, Tulul Amal, extending our hopes, you know, extending our dreams and aspirations where, we're ex where we expect to live for a long time, this is something that we have to be really, really careful, careful about. And a uh, very uh, interesting um, uh, quote that Abu Uthman al-Hindi gives us, he said he lived for a long time. You know, this is someone who uh, had lived for over a century. In fact, he reached the age of 130 years, you know. So, 
it's like you would expect uh, people that are uh, extremely old to, you know, kind of be uh, done with, you know, the uh, glamour of life, you know, that they're ready to go, you know, there's nothing is really attracting them. But listen to what he says. He says, I reached the age of 130 years, and there's nothing except that I know it decreases over time. You know, he lived for such a long time, he realized that everything decreases with time. Nothing stays the same, right? There's a growth period, and you reach, as everything reaches its culmination, and there's a down period, right? Nothing is going to be as beautiful as it was. No one will be as healthy and well, uh, or, or wealthy as they always were, right? Everything takes a down uh, turn sometime or the other. He said, except for my hope, except for my amal of still continuing to live for a long time, he said, for it still is as it always was. Even when he reached this, you know, ripe old age of 130 years, he was still hoping to live more. I remember one of the um, celebrities, I forget his name, he was really, he reached like, literally was his 100th birthday, non-Muslim. And he was a, you know, a, a small uh, man, but very, you know, energetic, and he was rich and famous. And, um, and on his 100th birthday, he was very happy, and he had a cigar in his mouth, and he's like, you know, he's like, it's been a great, who is that? George, oh yes, I think that was George Burns, yeah. So he has this famous quote, I guess, that's why I remember. Um, he said, you know, it's been a great hundred years, and I'm looking forward to the next hundred. <laughs> I, I, I heard him say this on TV. You know, so subhanAllah, Yani, this is just one thing. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, this is something that we just, you know, just don't get enough of. It's not like, okay, now I'm ready to go. You know, this is just the nature of the uh, human being. So tool al-amal, this is something that we want to uh, really, you know, uh, be aware of. And one of the uh, salaf, they said about tool al-amal, about extending our hopes, beautiful, beautiful uh, saying, نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِن طُولِ الْعَمَلْ فَإِنَّهُ يَمْنَعُ خَيْرَ الْعَمَلْ Which means that we seek refuge in Allah from extending our hopes because this is exactly what prevents the best of actions to take place. We can never be our best today if I'm putting that off to tomorrow. I can be good today and I can do better tomorrow because I'm counting on a tomorrow. You know, okay, I'm better today, I'll be my, on my best behavior tomorrow <coughs> with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this really, you know, we need to nip it in the bud. We have to think, I only have today, what is the best way that I can spend uh, this day? This is what will lead to ihsan, perfection uh, of, of deeds. And one of the golden principles of life, life that the Prophet ﷺ has given us, he told us, اِغْتَنِمْ خَمْسٍ قَبْلَ الْخَمْسِ شَبَابَ قَبْلَ حَرْمَكْ Take advantage of five things before five other things. شَبَابَ قَبْلَ حَرْمِكْ Which is your youth before your old age. وَصَحَّتَكْ قَبْلَ سَقَمِكْ And your sahha, your health before your illness, before your sickness. وَغَيْنَاكَ قَبْلَ فَقْرِكْ And your wealth before you become poor, before your poverty. وَفَرَاغَ قَبْلَ شُغْلَكْ And your free time before a time that you become preoccupied in. Your free time before you become too busy. وَحَيَاتَكْ قَبْلَ مَوْتِكْ And your life before you die. And you know, there's one thing that I want to say about um, free time versus becoming busy. You know, when you become busy working or studying, whatever it is, inshallah, you have good intentions. It's not like, you know, you're doing anything sinful. You know, it's not that you're busy in anything sinful. But the fact is that when you become occupied with something, it drains you physically. Which means at the end of the day, you're tired. So it's very hard at that point to pray like someone who's fully rested for ibadah. Right? There's a difference in the quality of ibadah. And this is what makes our deeds heavy on the mizan. The deeds uh, note on the scales with Allah are not counted. They are weighed. So two people may have prayed two rak'ahs, right? But the one who does so with complete khushu and attentiveness has a lot more weight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than one who was completely mind, mindless during her prayer. So, you know, it's, it's really faragh, uh, uh, free time, subhanAllah, this is, this is an amazing asset to take advantage of. And uh, Shaykh al-Maqdisi talks about tul al-amal. He's, he talks about what is it that causes us to extend our hopes even though we know that we're going to die soon. It's, uh, he says two uh, causes, n- number one, love of this world and al-jahl, ignorance, you know, just being ignorant of, of the reality of things. And death, um, even though we think it's hard to speak about, and, and indeed it is, it's very heavy. When Sister Faiza gave me this title, I was like, oh my God, you know, out of all the topics, you know, I have to talk about this, subhanAllah, it's, it's very hard to prepare. Um, but imagine how much more difficult it is to go through. To the point where the Prophet ﷺ himself, 
said inna lil mawti la sakarat that indeed you know death has its uh, you know uh, difficulty uh, so to speak so uh, the last point number 7 the last benefit that we're going to uh, mention you know regardless of, of how difficult it may be actually thinking about death recalling and remembering that it actually improves our relationship with others it improves our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it improves our relationship with uh, others and it really makes us treat ourselves better because we begin to invest in that which will be most beneficial to me because I am with no one except with me for the rest of my life for all of eternity there's no one who's going to be with me always except me so I don't want to hate me in the grave I don't want to hate me on the day of judgment there's no one else who you knows going to be there so death in fact Remembering that, in fact, what it does, great benefit. It really enhances the quality of your life. If we think about it, it sounds, you know, uh, oxymoronish, right? But um, it will improve your relationship with Allah. You'll go back to Him more fervently. It improves your relationship with others uh, for obvious reasons. And you will become more honest with yourself. So it improves your relationship with your own self. And inshallah, what we can do to make this more palatable is to try five minutes? Yeah. Okay, all right, inshallah. In the last five minutes, um, what we want to think about and hope for, and you know how to make this more palatable for all of us, is to contemplate and hope for, inshallah, and work towards what is called a beautiful death, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with a beautiful death because uh, this is a sahih hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, okay, in the, in the most authentic uh, books of hadith where the Prophet gave us glad tidings. Inna al mu'min idha hadrahu al mawt bushira bi ridwan Allahi wa karamatihi. That indeed the believer, when death comes to him, he is given the glad tidings of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with him and you know and the takreem, the karama, the honor you know that he's about to receive. So that there becomes nothing more beloved to him than what is before him. That is death and the hereafter. He wants to rush towards it. He wants to go, Yani. Uh, he does not, this is a person who wants to now die because of what it implies for him. He does not want to go back to dunya. He does not want to go back to, so everything that we think is so unpleasant to talk about will actually become the most uh, beloved thing to us, inshallah, if we spend our time properly. And of course, for the uh, you know, other type of person, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. وَأَمَّا صَحَبَ النَّارَ الَّذِي خَتَمَ لَهُ بِالسُّوءُ فَهُوَ يُبَشِّرُ بِهَا وَهُوَ فِي تِلْكَ الْأَحْوَالِ وَالْأَهْوَالِ Of course, for the other person, uh, for the person who's about to enter into the fire, that has uh, ended his life with the suu al-khatimah, may Allah protect us all from a bad ending. Um, he is also given the tidings of what is about to uh, befall him, and of course, we can't imagine his state. We seek Allah's refuge uh, from that. But we want, we want to work towards is the beautiful death. is a death that we can look forward to. A death that we can really uh, enjoy and be eager, uh, you know, to embrace. Because uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ has told us, مَنْ أَحَبَّ لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ لِقَاءَ وَمَنْ كَرِيهَ لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ كَرِيهَ اللَّهُ لِقَاءَ Which means that the one who loves to meet Allah, Allah also loves to meet him. And the one who hates to uh, meet Allah, Allah hates to meet him. Right? So we want to not just think of death as this, you know, really morbid uh, reality. We want to think of it as a meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that will only, uh, you know, we can only feel that if he's really our beloved in this life. It's really someone who knows, uh, uh, you know, we act like we really know him and are close to him. It's not someone who we've become estranged uh, from in our, in our practical lives. I just want to close with the signs of a good end. The signs of a good ending, which is called Husn al Khatima, right? The sign uh, that we can tangibly see uh, when people are uh, near death. Uh, if these signs are present, then it's an indication that they actually, um, uh, inshallah, have, have good awaiting, awaiting them. Number one is they're able to have husna than billah. They're able to hold a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the time of their death. So this me and this is what the Prophet ﷺ has, you know, really uh, emphasized, emphatically stressed. لا يموتن أحدكم إلا وهو يحزن الظن بالله عز وجل. That not do not let yani do not let any one of you die or don't uh, any one of you die except that you have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Why is this critical? This is critical because uh, Shaytan al malaun Shaytan the accursed, comes to the person at the exact time of their death as well. Just like he comes to us throughout our lives, he sees the moments of death. 
as his last opportunity to drag us into the fire with him. And subhanAllah, if there's anyone who knows how to use his time, it's the shaitan. Iblis does not waste time. He does not waste any opportunity. He has millions of years of experience, like we always mention. He's very good at what he does, and he's successful in his goals with the majority of humankind, unfortunately, right? Because Allah says, Wal asr in insana lafi khusr, right? By time, uh, he, the human being is in a state of loss, except for, uh, and you know the rest of the verse, those who do good deeds and um, believe and do good deeds and exhort each other to, um, good, uh, you know, to the good in this world. So um, what we want to do is have the best opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the shaitan will come to the person and because the person is in the difficulty of death, at that time, the goal of the shaitan is to make us become angry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is his goal at the time of death. So that the person would commit uh, or you know, an act of kufr or say something uh, you know, close to kufr. So, husna then billah, this is why the Prophet stressed this so much that if you have a good opinion of Allah, you will not enter into the state of displeasure or anger with him. This is why it is critical that we, uh, inshallah, at that time, uh, not panic, okay, uh, and just maintain a good, uh, inshallah, you know, good hopes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, signs of a good ending, is the ability to say the kalima. La ilaha illallah, right, to be able to say, and this is what the Prophet sallallahu has told us, laqinu, uh, which means is to make your uh, people that are uh, near death, make them say the kalima. And a sign of a uh, good ending is that the person will, be able to say the kalima and they're going to love to say it. They're going to just want to keep saying it. Okay? And subhanAllah, uh, one of our teachers, uh, she was telling uh, us, uh, you know, in, in a dars that someone attended, they related to me that there was a group of people near death or there was a room, you know, in, in, in the hospital or somewhere that people were about to die and they were trying to get them to say the kalima. And the majority of them were not able to say it. There was only two or three people that actually were able to say the la ilaha illallah. So this is something that inshallah we want to try to make dhikr of it as much as we can in this world so that it will be easy for us uh, at that time. And number three, a sign of good ending, uh, the last thing, is an overall state of tranquility that the person will be in. There, there's not going to be panic or distress, you know, or oh my God, you know, this is, uh, you know, there's not going to be that state uh, of anxiety and, and panic. Rather, there's going to be overall tranquility, uh, which will be obvious. Uh, on, on, on the person, why? Because of the good, owing to the good that he is seeing, because Allah Subhanahu will be showing uh, them the good that uh, is before them. And uh, we're going to end with this quote of Ibn Abd Rabihi. He asked Makhul, Do you love paradise? And he said, Who does not love it? So he said, Then love death, because you will not see paradise until you die. So, uh, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us uh, among those who love to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He loves to meet them. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal-Asr inna al-insana la fi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amanu al-salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Indeed, the human beings are, by time, human beings are in, the, the insan is in a state of loss except for those who believed and did good deeds and exhorted each other to the truth and exhorted each other to uh, patients. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullah wa natubu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.